right in this first session at group by rich is going to be talking about how to make your emergency toolkit so take it away rich okay um hi welcome to the presentation um i'm rich banner i am um i work for a product vendor i'm a, a performance specialist uh, i primarily deal with with all your refactoring um the architecture of a of a database and, and basically making making our tool faster um one part of what I do is um, our clients tend to host their own SQL Server instances locally, um, and we obviously act as a support agent to the customers. Um, sometimes if there's an extremely urgent issue or a high priority issue, something that needs to fix them quickly, they'll come and get me. Um, I'll jump on and have to fix it as quick as I can, get the client back up, get it working, and then we can triage and get it fixed at a later point. Um, one thing that has made my life a lot easier working here is creating a toolkit um, that I've got in a few different places that will allow me to quickly jump on. It gives me a prioritized list of what I need to do in what order, um, and I can work through them until the issue is resolved or until it diagnoses the problem that I can then go and fix. Um, the presentation will be on richbender.com slash toolkit. There's some contact details if you want to get a hold of me. I'll put them up again at the end. Um, so, why are you here? Um, you are probably the main line of defense against the SQL Server. Um, the idea of this is that you can build it at whatever level you're at. You can either be, you may be an accidental DBA who has to do these things, not regularly, but when you do them, you want to be able to do them quickly. Um, or you may be a senior DBA who knows what they're doing. But again, if you can put a little bit of work in at the beginning, it'll save you a lot of time later, you can get things fixed and look really good to your managers. Um, you don't have time to waste. Uh, I know how busy everybody is nowadays. Um, if you're not busy, then it's not going to be long to get more work dumped on your plate. Um, so you want to make things as streamlined as possible. Um, Again, you might not have a lot of knowledge at this point, but the purpose of these scripts and some of the sample scripts I'll show you is that you don't necessarily need to have um, a lot of knowledge on on the internals of SQL Server. But these scripts that are written by people who do have the knowledge of SQL Server will point you towards uh, the resolution how to fix it, and hopefully as quickly as possible. Um, so let's make a toolkit. So it's a set of scripts that will help you diagnose issues. Um, we'll number them so that you have a have that prioritized list so you can you can literally start as script one, script two, script three, and work through until you work out from and you can resolve it. Um, you want to make sure it's kept up to date. A few of these scripts um, are released monthly. Um, some of them are released slightly less, but generally a good idea for these kits to keep them as up to date as possible. You're always getting new SQL Server instances, uh, sorry, versions released, uh, new features, um, and a lot of these scripts will will have to be slightly modified, or there may be enhancements to them for later versions. So, generally, you want to be keeping on top of it. Maybe check it once a month, see if there's new versions of the scripts. Um, but when there are new versions, you want to make sure you know how they work. You want to make sure that either they work the same way as they did before. Um, or you want to know what parameters we want to use or what the output's going to look like for the latest version. Um, a couple of the scripts sometimes have major revisions, so um, we'll be going through some of the first responder kit scripts, um, and sometimes when a new version's out, they'll rework it and maybe move some functions into a different parameter. Um, so you, you need to be able to know how they're going to work and the, and the outputs. You don't want to just be downloading the latest version every time and running it unless you are confident that you can deal with potentially not looking how you expect it. But again, spending 10, 15 minutes when the new version's out to work out how that works is going to mean you don't get surprises when everybody's panicking and a server's on fire and you need to fix it. So, um, these are all community tools. Uh, there's a couple of scripts that I've either written or modified from scripts I've found. The rest of them, I will point you to the original authors, where to get them, and and how to get them. So, there's a few scripts that are on blogs. Um, 
we'll, we'll go through them later. But yeah, there's a few that are, are compact enough to be on blogs. Um, we'll go through uh, Adam Mechanics SP Who is Active. Um, I'll show you why you want to be using that instead of the inbuilt ones. Uh, and we will go through a couple of scripts from the first responder kits as well. Uh, if I have time, there's a few more scripts to go through, but I don't want to rush through these ones. So we'll do these and then there's a link at the end to where I'll host this um, and I'll put some more scripts on there that might be helping. So you get given a server, you need to fix it as quickly as possible. So you need to prioritize. Uh, there's a number of different priorities that you can do. We've got the servers on fire, it's melting, the CPU's maxed out. You, basically, people are panicking, it's down. You want to get it up as quickly as possible. Um, you can have intermittent outage issues, so some, ha some uh, users are having issues, some particular pages are having issues. Um, slightly less urgent, but it's obviously still you want to fix it as soon as possible, you get it back up. Um, or uh, there's other issues where people report it's slower. It's been slowing down over the past month or two. It's not as fast as it used to be. I'm sure you can think of reasons why that might be, but we can get some scripts to try and help us analyze that. Um, so what I like to do is start with some diagnostics of what I'm working with. Because there's a 90% chance I haven't seen the server before, and the wide variety of servers that it, that it could be, hardware specs, software specs. I like to run a diagnostic so you can get a baseline of, of what the server looks like that you're working with, how big it is, um, some information like that. So we, wanna, we care about some database settings, um, specifically hardware and software. Um, once we know what we're working with, we want to look at what's happening now. Um, so you can use SPU's Active for that. We'll go through that in a second. Um, but yeah, that tells you what's running on the server right now, which once you know that can kind of help you dig down a little deeper if it's an issue with what's running right now. And it's not an issue that nothing's running right now. Um, we'll go through SV Blitz first, um, which has a, it's a massive script. It's got a load of parameters. We'll just go with the basic script at this point. Um, and you can have a look through at things like expert mode and, and settings like that if that interests you. Um, but we won't specifically go over that. But uh, these two scripts are on GitHub. Um, again, I'll point you towards where they are. You can go through and, and I do implore you to have a look at these scripts and, and kind of step through them yourself when you have a little time and try and work out where they're getting the information from and what it means. Um, and then it, it really helps your knowledge of, of A, how the internals of SQL Server work, uh, and B, how to get it back up running, and how to, uh, to help the performance. Um, we'll look at wait stats as well on the server. Um, there's a, a blog script that I'll point you towards for that, that'll help you um, analyze that. That helps tell you if you've got a specific CPU issue or a, an IO issue or, or locking. That'll help narrow down a little bit further as well. Um, and then finally, we'll look at this performance, um, whether you're on spinning rust, whether you're on hard disks, um, or potentially network issues uh, will get picked up when you try and see how well your disks are performing. Um, so going through the basics, um, in the, on the site where I'll point you towards at the end, um, script one is called environment.sql. This is what I use um, to try and work out what basic hardware and basic settings are. Um, it'll give you things like the instance name, the machine name, uh, what product version we're working on, so you know if it's um, 2008 versus 2017, you might approach fixing these slightly differently. Um, whether we got a HADR solution on there, if it's clustered, availability groups, um, how long it's been up. One of the fun things that people like doing when a SQL server is going slow is to reboot it, and then you've lost a bunch of information like performance counters, um, which don't persist through a restart. If you've been very good and they're on 2016 plus and have the query still switched on, you can still get some information from the query store because that persists through a restart, but a bunch of stuff doesn't. Uh, so I like to check server uptime so that if they've rebooted it this morning, I know to take some of the perf counters with a pinch of salt. However, if it's been up for months, 
great, we've got more information we can dig through for. Um, how many cores are we working with and what sort of processor potentially are we working with? Um, I had a client issue today, two core SQL Server, and it was complaining for, for, for SOS scheduler yield weight type, um, and that is CPU. So straight away, seeing that, two cores, yeah, I, I bet weight stats are going to be an issue and the CPU, but at least you know what you're starting with and obviously the amount of RAM you're working with. Um, guys here, most of you will know that SQL Server uses as much RAM as it can. It's greedy, it will just take it all, but knowing how much we're working with uh, will help, especially when we get to the point of checking things like our database sizes, so you know how much of your data you can cache, uh, and then some of the perf counters might help as well. So, um, all you have to do with environment.sql is get this script, put it on the server, run it. It's going to give you results something like this. Um, the script is very simple. You can see what it does and where it gets this information from. But knowing that this particular instance here um, is SQL Server 2016, SP1, Enterprise, with 40 cores and 250 gigs of RAM, it's been up for 10 days. It hasn't been up for that long because it's only a, a test server. But understanding that this is a fairly decent sized server, 40 cores and 256 gig of RAM, you'd approach that differently than you would for a server with four cores and 16 gig of RAM. Uh, from here, you want to be asking yourself if there's, if there's anything out of the ordinary. Is there an issue here? Are they running web edition? Um, are they running standard edition um, and it's not going to utilize all the cores? Um, this will help you get to the, to the original, to the start problems. Um, so you want to have a look for any immediate issues. Now you know what you're working with, let's try and have a look what's happening. So um, in the first responder kit, which again is uh, firstresponderkit.org or I'll point you towards the GitHub directly, um, we're going to start with SP Blitz first. Now one of the prerequisites for Blitz first is that you need Blitz cache. Now all these are two SQL scripts, run, put them on your server, run it and it'll install the um, store procedure. You can then call it and check your results. So you need to stick, stick on SP Blitz Clash and then SP Blitz first. Um, if we have time for demos, I'll show you actually how that works in practice slightly later. Um, once you've installed the store procs, you just call them, execute the store proc. Now again, there are a number of parameters you can pass through. Things like expert mode, equals one will give you more information it will give you four or five result sets other than this standard one depending on the use case for your toolkit if you are confident that more information will help by all means set your scripts to run it in expert mode um, however if for example you wanted to give this script to a support desk uh, to our help desk, um, you may give them this script, but don't tell them to run it with expert mode. There is, it does give you a lot of information, which is very useful, but if you're not particularly confident in your SQL abilities, then perhaps don't jump into expert mode. It's a, it's a bit of an overload. Um, the results of Blitz First will give you a prioritized table like this. Um, priority naught is always there. Um, priorities 200, 250 and above um, are informative. Um, closer to one is prioritized as more important. If you've got a one, you've got a major problem, but it'll tell you what it is. Um, on this particular server, um, I ran it during a data load. Uh, it gives us a priority 40, which is pretty, pretty high, um, but it doesn't mean the server's on fire. Um, this particular script tells us that uh, forward fetches are high. Now, on there, um, there's a how to stop it column, and opening that will tell you what you need to do. Now, if you know much about indexing, you'll know that forward fetches is because you've got heap tables that haven't been rebuilt in a while. Um, so you either want to rebuild your heaps potentially, or look at adding clustered indexes to those heaps. 
uh, to try and avoid the, the forward fetch issue. But the, the links there will give you a step-by-step -step of how to fix it or a, a link to somewhere that will tell you how to fix it. So it's very good for, for narrowing down a first point of what's happening. And again, if you wanted to provide this script to your help desk team to try and stop the volume of calls coming to you, give them this and they can say right so the output of that is that it's currently running at high forward fetches um, I'll show you if we, again if we have time for demos if I don't talk for too long we'll go through a couple of demos later and I'll show you other examples of what can go on but if you want to know everything it will report on have a look at the script just just go through step by step it's 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 an awful lot of lines of rows of data you're talking thousands but the way it's built is very logical and very sensible. So you can just dig through and have a look at what it's going to report on and how it would know these issues. Um, and yeah, don't worry about the size of the scripts. They are big, but they're a lot less intimidating than you think they are the first time you see them. Um, yeah, so the higher on the list your, your issue is, then it's going to appear high. It's going to tell you things like if you've got high CPU, uh, if you're running out of memory, you're going to have um, different flags in there depending on on the symptoms. Um, right, so when you're looking at what's running right now, everything's active, you've got two options. I'm going to tell you the first one, I'm going to tell you why not to use it and why to use the second one. So Microsoft built in SPWho and SPWho2 um, that are inbuilt system store procedures that you can just call and it'll tell you all active connections to the database right now. Um, you literally just exec SPHU2, and it's going to give you an output something like that, um, which will tell you all connections to the database, but you'll notice the vast majority of these are either background processes or they're sleeping. <coughs> they're not doing anything right now. Um, this is fine, but to find out if what user processes are running right now, you can have thousands of rows of data on here. It's, it's an awful lot of data to dig through. Um, which, when you're under time pressure, you don't want to be messing about with. Uh, so, I suggest we don't use this. Um, we look off and we run SP who is active. Now, this is a store procedure that's written by Adam Mechanic. Uh, years back, it is maintained. Um, but what this will do is give us a much nicer view of what's happening. Um, it's going to give you an output something like this. Uh, this was run a few days ago. Um, on a server I have. It tells you all processes that are running right now. Uh, things like, it's it's sorted by how long they've been running for. Um, so you can see I've got a process that's been running here for 60 days, um, which is fun to find out. But um, what this also does is it gives you the query text of what the process is doing. If you run SPHU2, if you want to find out what process the SPID is running, you have to run things like DBCC input buffer, which just takes takes time, especially when you're in a rush. So this, you can just click on a query text and it'll open up a new XML window and show you what query it's running. Now I know that that 60-day process was just a diagnostics process that's in the background. It's not actually doing anything. If you have a look, it's used zero CPU and 20 reads in 60 days. It's, it wasn't actually an issue, but seeing 60 days was a bit of a surprise. Um, and you can see all the other currently active connections of the database, things like how much CPU they're using. We've got one there that seems to be using a lot of CPU um, and doing a bunch of reads for this database. That's a bunch of reads. Um, and it will tell you things like the status, so whether they're actually taking up CPU, whether they're running. It's just much nicer to use this than it is to try and dig through SPU2. And this will help us with things also like blocking, which I'm sure you've all come across it. It can be a massive pain. Um, but having this, instead of having to scroll up and down thousands of rows to try and work out what what's causing your blocking, you've only got nine rows of data here, um, depending on your server. It just It's much nicer. I highly suggest you get SPHO is active, download the latest version, make sure you know how it works, and go and run it in your instance um, to see what's happening, rather than use SPHO too, because Nobody's got time for, for SPHU2 all the time. Um, once you've been through there and you know that put, 
look at things like blocking you know it's not an issue if this doesn't resolve the issue then we need to go to the next step step further um, we're going to look at weight statistics now this is um, it uses a lot of system counters but basically this tells us where potential bottlenecks might be in our SQL Server um, this particular script I'm going to use was written by Paul Randall at SQLSkills.com. Um, you get it from here. Don't worry about writing that down. I'll give you a link to this at the end um, so you can follow that. Uh, one thing to notice from this script is the default that it scans wait stats for is 30 minutes. Um, what it does is it takes a snapshot of the data, uh, waits 30 minutes by default, takes another snapshot and compares what's happening right now. Um, obviously, when a server's on fire, we don't want to wait 30 minutes for a result. Um, I change mine to 30 seconds as a default. If you feel like that's not enough or too much, you can have your own version in your folder, which is whatever time you want. If you only care about five seconds snapshot, what's happening right now. I found 30 seconds is more of a, a sweet spot for me, but that's in my toolkit. When you build yours, if you want a different parameter, Go for it, stick it in, that's not a problem. Um, so the output of that will look something like this. Um, it, all, it sorts your wait types by um, the total wait time over the time period you've given it. Now, this gives, your, your total wait time will be wait time per core. So if you're running a 40 core processor and you run the process for a second, you could potentially have up to 40 seconds of wait um, over that one second period because it counts per core for your CPU. Um, looking at this, if you've not seen uh, wait stats before, it might not mean a lot. Even if you do know wait stats, it might not mean a lot. What is write log? What is latch ex? There's dozens of different wait times and very few people would be able to tell you what all weight types are off the top of their head. So um, I keep a link to this particular page, which again, SQL Skills, um, they have an excellent list of all known weight types. Uh, you can find your weight type, click on it, it'll tell you what it is, what sort of category it is. Um, write log is fairly self-explanatory, it's going to be um, your log files. LatchEx is, again, it'll tell you some more information about it. CX packet means parallelism is happening, but CX packet doesn't really mean much by itself. You'd need to know that that is a par parallelism issue. I'm sure some of you are seeing SOS scheduler yield and, and having hyperventilating a bit. Um, that's a, a CPU contention flag. But again, if you don't know them, um, you wouldn't be expected to know them. As you run this more often, you'll get the hang of what your most common ones are in your sorts of environments. Um, but if you're not sure what one are, what any of them are, you can go to that link um, and just drill down and it'll tell you what they are and, and that will give you an idea of, of either how to fix them or where you need to go next. You have a comment yeah. from uh, Brent. He says, "Bonus, even even our 40, on our forty core box, you can have more than forty seconds if multiple processes are waiting for the same." I guess you're in other kinds yes. of problems. Yeah, you can you can stack them. But yeah, that, that kind of the point was that if you you can have more than a second of wait times in a one second yeah. period, you can have multiple. So you don't don't necessarily worry that you're seeing if you're seeing 40 seconds or 100 seconds of wait times in a second. That just means ever, like you've got more than one process waiting and it's per core as well. So it's, and we were also laughing at, sorry. Hmm? Go on. <laughs> no, we were also laughing at, at the fact that your uh, SA account is called totally not SA. And we had at least someone say, JD Walker says stolen, I'm gonna rename the SA account. My yeah, no, nobody calls it S, no, nobody ever uses SA to log on all of my demo <laughs> machines it's, it's totally not SA I'll give you three guesses on what the password are for my demo machines <laughs> password yeah that's right <laughs> but I follow yeah, all the best practices right? for demos log on as SA use password as password yeah just all the terrible things the only time I, I get to do it I try and say password by default was blank that was nice 
Yes. Yeah, that was um, interesting. Yeah, no, you'll, when we go through the demos, you'll notice that as well. I, I'll always use totally not essay as my essay password because yeah, nobody should do that in real life. Nobody ever does that. I'm sure nobody's ever seen anybody using essay other than all the time. Or that it might crash a service pack install or something. So best practice is to rename it back to essay, install the, the update or CU or SP, rename it back again. Yeah, it's not here to discussion. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's this sort of things. It's you come across them, don't you? But yeah, I like to like to mess about when it comes to demos. Be a bit more reasonable on live servers and production, but for demos, nobody really cares, do they? <laughs> none, none of these are network available, so I don't worry about security as such because they're all local. Okay, uh, any more questions before I carry on? No, nope, just love. Don't see any more. Okay, excellent. Um, so, SQLSquares.com, excellent resource for what wait types are until you get a handle on on what they are. Half of these, I can probably tell you what they are off the top of my head. Half of them, I don't see them often. Preemptive OS authentication ops, I could guess. But if you want to be sure, go to that web address and you can tell what they are. So... If that doesn't fix it, then you probably want to start looking at disk performance. Uh, if you've got, you might have a wait stat which is um, showing high network I/O waits. Um, one of the earlier, uh, the Blitz first script might tell you you've got network issues. I have to double check that. Um, but if we want to, if we suspect disk performance, then we want to have a script for checking our disk performance. We don't want to be digging around and making something go fly. We just want to be able to chuck something on and get it working. Now, a few things about disks. SSGs are slick cheap nowadays. Spinning Rust is slow. So a lot of people, we were talking about this before the webinar, um, a lot of people are still on hard drives for servers, whereas most laptops nowadays will be SSDs. Um, it's crazy that people have SQL servers on spinny disks. Um, partly because of their performance, partly because you're spending so much on SQL Server licensing, and then you go and put it on cheap hardware. It's it's daft, but we want to be able to check what we're working with. Um, is network speed an issue? Even if it's on SSDs, you may have, a, they may have cheaped out a RAID controller, um, and your network speeds aren't up to scratch, but we can check that whilst checking our disk performance. It will gives a general idea and we can then go and call the network guy and say disks don't seem to be performing that well. Um, disk performance can cause um, a lot of issues. It's the architecture of SQL Server, writing and reading. You might sometimes get away with it. If you're reading a lot of data just out of memory, um, if you're doing a lot of small reads and it, it can load all the data into memory, disks might not actually be too much of a concern, although it's still not great. But in other workloads, depending on what the product is, what the SQL Server is for, there can be a lot of problems caused by slow disks. Um, there's a script written by a guy called David Pless um, from Microsoft called, well, I, my version is called disk Um David didn't quite do what I wanted it to do for my applications, so I've modified his script um, for my toolkit which I'll give you my version of, but it's still very much the brainchild of David Pless. Um, I'll give you a link to where it's from as well. It's, it's embedded in the script to say who the original author was and the fact that it's been adapted slightly from that. Um, what we'll see um, from these checks is something like this. Um, it will give you per file the general performance and it will give you a great idea for, for how you're looking um, on your boxes. Now, he takes Microsoft recommendations and has kind of built them into the script. Um, and that's the read performance and, and write performance here are extremely handy, especially if, again, you were going to give this to, a say, a support team, a first-line help desk, um, knowing that they, they might not know what a good read stall is. Um, in fact, we'll just go through it quickly for read stall. So read stall and write stall is what you're going to focus on mostly when 
looking at your disks. That is basically, it's a lot more complicated than this, but it's, it's how long a process takes to request information from the server and request it back um, and receive the data back. You know, purposes of reads, for writes, it's how long it takes for it to send data and get the confirmation it's been received by the server. That's, again, it's more complicated, but as a general rule of thumb, it's how your disks are performing. Um, you can see on this server, uh, we've got mostly good. Good writes. Um, I've got one particular file I potentially want to look at. It's the, the live database data file. I've had to to remove data to file names here, but ultimately, if we were worried about disks, we'd look at that one and see perhaps why that disk is running slowly, or that file is running slowly. Um, but this tells me that actually probably disks aren't the issue. Again, knowing what this output looks like and knowing what you're looking for is pretty essential. Um, you don't want to be running this for the first time on a client machine or on a server you haven't seen before and then trying to sit there and work out what this means. Having a basic understanding of how it works is, is always a great idea. Uh, and what you can do with any of these scripts, you take your copy of them, save them in your toolkit. Um, you can even fork a copy of the GitHub ones if you want. If you're going to use them yourself and want to add more functionality, uh, you can modify them. Uh, if you want to give it to a support team and it needs to be a bit more in-depth or maybe they don't need so much information, you can take parts out or, or put comments in and, and give guidance in these scripts to try and, to try and make them as performant as possible. Um, for example, one of the scripts that I've used is Blitz First. Um, but I've given a copy to our support desk with a number of functions removed. It's still blitz first, um, but it's not as big as it was, uh, and it's it's basically the basics um, to try not to overload the input. So the, the version of blitz first I use for, for the support desk toolkit different to the one I use, but again that's because I'm probably more comfortable in in having a bunch of data fired at my eyes than than a support desk would be. They just want to, they do generally don't have the time to dig in and you want to try and quick wins. So any of these scripts just modify, um, but don't, don't be horrible and, and just take them and claim them as your own. It's, they are written, this script for example is David Pless's script, I've just made slight modifications so it suits my needs. So just remember where you got your data from, it's only nice. Um, what we'll do, I can show you a few of these scripts and how they work in some demos because I have talked the legs off this. So let me just get rid of that and open Manager Studio. Um, now one of the things that I've done in my time is um, I've had most problems that you can imagine. Um, I've seen things that you would only see in movies and if you were joking. Um, right, Management Studio is being slow, so I'll use this instance. So, I'm using, I've got a couple of demo machines here. Um, they are the Stack Overflow 2010 database, um, which was on brentnozo.com. If you have a Google for Stack Overflow database, you'll find a torrent of the full thing, um, but you're talking 140 gig, I think, unzipped for the entire database. Um, this file is about a gig zipped and about 10 unzipped. Uh, it is the website Stack Overflow's database, um, but the data from the first two years, I think, when it existed, so 2009-2010. Um, it gives you some basic fields, um, and you can build a number of queries on just for, I like it for demo purposes. Um, I've got, let me just get this machine, make sure it's happy. In fact, what I'll show you before, the demo I couldn't show you, um, there, there's a demo I can't run because it maxes out the CPU and I think it'll crash go to webinar. So I ran it before um, and I will show you the results of it now. So, not demo one, it's demo three. So I had a server which 
when I checked it was high CPU. Now, I know these servers are single core, four gig of RAM servers because they're running on my laptop. So I didn't run the, the first check, but I did run bits first on it. Um, now this, you can see I had high CPU utilization uh, on my server. Now, you can also see there's high CPU utilization, not SQL Server. Um, if you if you need some more information, Blitz First will always give you a link to a blog post, <laughs> and you can go and dig in a little bit further. Um, but yeah, I, I knew this one was high CPU because, um, well, high CPU on the server, but it's not SQL Server. Now, the reason for this is something I've legitimately seen live. Um, is somebody running a game on a SQL server. I've had somebody who had, um, they, they were playing a game installed on the SQL server because it was nice and um, highly powered compared to their little desktop. Um, so I, I ran this remotely from my machine, high CPU, not SQL server. Um, and then you come to something like them playing a game. Um, legitimately happened and I went down with the uh, permission revoke for said developer because they thought they were uh, they were being smart and running games on a SQL server that's monitored by IT is an excellent idea um, but this is the sort this of the thing time in, this is the first Sorry? time in something like 20 years that I've have, had ever and heard ever heard this happening in real life it's it's the standing yeah. joke we're all in IT right Let's just make a PlayStation out of this 64-core machine. Exactly. I've seen all sorts of nonsense. I've actually made myself a bingo card, which I'll show on the next <laughs> slide, um, that you can have for a week. I've got a little th little board here. I can put it up and uh, see how many, see how long it takes to get bingo. There's all sorts of nonsense. I've seen, uh, well, I'll go through the, the bingo <laughs> card in a minute, but it's there's some silly things on there, and none of them are made up. They've all happened. It's crazy. Brent says, um, put it is, up. <laughs> Bingo is awesome. Is this? It's not. Um, yeah, oh, it's, I'll go find it. This isn't in this role, just to, to preface that. It's in my uh, DBA career. But if we go through, uh, wrong slide. Um, yeah, if we can finally get there. Give me a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. I crashed. I crashed Rich presentation. <laughs> I, I didn't minimize it. I closed it, didn't I? So I've got to get back to where I was. <laughs> right there. Here's my bingo. So it's things like, um, can Ooh. you have a look at this server? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, what is it? Oh, our Oracle server. Right. Okay. I've got bingo um, already. <laughs> yeah, it's if you can find a board for it, just keep it on there. Legitimately, I've seen somebody using it as a torrent box. Um, people running their own web servers from a from a live server. Um, there's some of these which are probably more common. Things like um, having percentage file growth. That's that's a lot more common. Um, people mining stuff. Even it, it, they weren't caught doing it, but they were the um, the software was caught on there. Um, also, if people come up to you and say things like, SQL Server is using an awful lot of memory. Yeah, yeah it's going to do that. Um, but a lot of people don't don't understand. Oh, if you're not a DBA and you don't understand how SQL Server works, it may be surprised that SQL Server is using a lot of memory, but trying to, um, trying to explain that to people is it, it will use as much memory as it can. It's greedy. It's going to fight things. It will crash windows if it has to. Um, so many war stories here. Yeah, uh, da, 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 da. yeah. People browsing on SQL servers so they can bypass and get on Reddit. If the um, if if the content filter wouldn't allow certain websites, it worked out you could do it from a server. Bless them. Um, <laughs> but then you've got things like auto shrink and default max up and cost threshold. They are very common but they allow you to fill up your, uh, your bingo board. Oh, yeah, and developer locking a database. 
yeah. and testing and, and leaving the transaction yeah. open. Less. So um, I'm aware I am probably running out of a bit of time. I don't want to do overrun to the next session. Um, but let's um, close this. And we can run a quick live demo, something that isn't going to crash the machine. So let's get rid of that. I don't want that anymore. Let's connect to our demo one system. Now I'm going to run. Um, I'm using a, in case anybody want, wonders how this works, I'm using a tool called SQL Query Stress, um, which if I remember correctly, is from somewhere like uh, QueryStress.com or SQLStress.com. But I'll put that on the website. It's um, a tool that you can you can give it a script, um, point it towards a database, and tell it how many times you want it to run a script uh, as how many users. And you use it. It's a load testing tool. You can stress SQL out. You can run stuff. Um, for this demo, I am doing just a select top 10 from post but ordering my new ID which I know is is not a great idea <laughs> but it's going to put some load in our server and I'm running it um, a thousand times as 200 threads so for this little VM I'm using it's going to hurt so we'll click that running um, this is my machine so we'll go through our toolkit so this is the toolkit as is um, we'll start at the beginning uh, we run our environment, we can see what we're working with. I know it's demo machine, 2017 RTM, developer, because I'm not running it live. It hasn't been up for long because I've been messing about with demos. One CPU and four cores. Now, if this was live, I'd be having a heart attack, but for the purposes of demos, it's, uh, it's not out of the ordinary. Uh, so if we want to see what's happening right now, um, Oh, that's interesting. I've deleted the script. I have it installed, um, but basically you would run the script, install it, and then just run SP who's active. Um, I can see that I've got one thing running at the moment. Um, it's been running for an hour. Fun fact, before this, query stress crashed on me before the demo, and I had to reboot it and kill it. Looks like it never actually finished and never actually closed the connection. So I can see that I've got a process that's been running for an hour, um, if I want to see what it's doing, it was running an update, um, which, oh, in fact, I could probably kill that now. Nope. I was messing about locking a database. So as that's rolling back, who's active, you can see it's doing a rollback. It's been doing that for four seconds. Once that's done, if it completes, um, then we'll be able to see the other processes catching up. Um, they would have been blocked by my developer leaving a transaction unblocked. I shot myself in the foot. Right. Um, what we'll do as well, then we'll move on to the next script while we wait for that to finish. So uh, Blitz Cache, this is the sort of thing that Blitz Cache will look like. You can see the size of it down on my toolbar here. All you do, execute it, it installs. Uh, once that's installed, we'll do the same thing with Blitz first. Run it. If it's already there, it doesn't matter. Um, it will just it'll create a store proc and then it'll alter it. If it's already there, skip this bit and just alter it to the latest version. So you don't have to worry about um, if you're running this more than once. You can run it as many times as you want. It's not going to make a blind bit of difference. Um, in fact, what we can then do... Um, If you run Blitz first, you can see what's happening. Now I'm just going to go back here and see if that's finished yet. Yes, yeah, so you can see my rollback, and then we can see session ID 261 running, which is my tab up here. Uh, so this gives me a nice list saying I've got a query currently rolling back. Um, and if, you've got an, if you want to go to this link here, you can find out some more information about why it's rolling back uh, and why rolling back transactions are an issue. Um, this is the sort of thing you'll see um, when you click on how to stop it. 
this particular script um, basically tells you don't panic and restart your server. Um, you're going to have to wait for it to finish with a rollback. Um, please don't restart your server. You're going to cause yourself all end of nightmares. Um, but the problem with a rolling back is ultimately you have to wait for it to finish, um, which is a pain. And this server we can see also sitting there at 97 cents CPU. So it's less of a priority than a query rolling back. The fact that your CPU on your server is sitting there at high may not actually be an issue if that's your workload. Um, although I wouldn't be comfortable at a server constantly sitting at 97%, it probably means it's underutilized. Um, unless you're worried about things like Azure and you want to make the most of your bang for your buck. Um, if we run this again now, I, we can see that our query is still rolling back. I th would have thought that I completed by now. We run this again. If it wants to. Yeah, so we can see that the rolling back process is finished now. And it's telling us um, high CPU at 94% of the server. And we've also got low page life expectancy now. Um, again, how to stop it, add more memory to the server, or find the queries reading a lot of data. Now, again, I know for this server that it's not got much provision for memory. Um, so actually, I, I know that's going to happen. But if you don't know what's happening, Again, prioritize list. The rollback was probably most important, uh, priority one. And then this gives me an idea of I want to look at CPU and I want to look at my memory. But it gives me a bit more information on what to go on. So just to see the output of a few more, if you check my disk speed for this, um, again, it's this is the blog post where I originally got the script uh, from David Pless. It's, it's a Microsoft blog. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I, I just messed about with it a bit and made it suit me. Um, I run that. It's all running on a local SSD on my laptop. It's got an M2 drive. It's fine. Um, we can see my read stalls are, are all fine. They're all good. Um, I've potentially got one write in my tempdb file, which I'd look at. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, it doesn't matter. 26 isn't terrible you, you want that to be less than 10 ideally but if this was live i'd go right temp db log file so i know that i go and have a look at i what drive that's on um what's happening in temp db am i am i doing a lot of stuff in temp db i've got a lot of spills um but knowing this information will allow you to go further just have a quick look at the, the final two scripts. So we've got, this is the wait stats script directly from Paul Randall. Uh, the parameter I talked about changing from 30 minutes to 30 seconds is just there. Um, what will do we run this? Now, this is going to take 30 seconds at least. If you're not running this yourself and give it to somebody else, it might be worth putting a disclaimer at the top to say this is going to take at least 30 seconds and then follow up with but if it takes more than two minutes, something's wrong. Um, just so that people don't panic, because if they run a script and they just sit there and it's just taking ages, they uh, people can panic. So again, depending on your audience, it might be worth putting a little little comment at the top to say, yeah, it's going to take 30 seconds. So it's finished now. Um, we can see the only wait type is SOS scheduler yield. If you know what that is, great. It means you go and look at your CPU. If you don't, um, it gives you a link directly to the SQL, Squil SQL Skills site, um, which if I mess about and do it in SSMS, I can show you what it looks like. So it gives you a, a brief description of the weight type. Come on. All right, what I'll do. Management Studio isn't it's known for its um, again. Hang on. What we'll 
do. I'll Chrome it because Management Studio isn't known for being a great browser. And yeah, you can see what I do when I'm uh, messing about. So um, what it'll tell you, it's a scheduler yield. Gives you a brief description of what it is and when it get added in. Um, ultimately, without reading through this in a live demo, it is a CPU contention issue. Um, it allow you to go go into a bit more detail as to how to fix it. Now, just to briefly show you the list of different weight types on here, um, they're alphabetized, but you can see that's quite a list of of weight types. If anybody knew those off the top of their head, I'd be extremely impressed. Um, considering they're also they're adding new ones all the time. Um, with every different version, you'll see a new type of weight stat and they may not be very well documented by Microsoft. Um, yeah, that's quite the list. Uh, I think we'll probably call it there so that we've got time before the next presentation. Are there any more questions, guys? Not really questions. There was a discussion about uh, who was allowed to log on interactively on the server, which is a problem and why this problem appears. And um, yeah. yeah, it's going back and forth between bad management policies, consultants, not me, but all the other consultants, yeah, and so on. Yeah, I've, I've seen it before. Things like using Management Studio on the server when you've already got high CPU, yeah, exactly. you want to make sure you can use Management Studio on a box that isn't your server and just connect. So, for example, all of these, Management Studio is on my laptop, and they're just connected into the server, because otherwise, yeah, you'll see... Also I've seen quite a few like developers that. who just won't install Management Studio on their local machine, probably because they think they'll need to install all of your SQL Server. Um, and more yeah. commonly, I've seen uh, uh, consultants, when they bring their own laptop, that laptop isn't on the client's domain, so they can't use SQL Server authentication without a few tricks. And yeah. Many people don't know those tricks, so it'll yeah. make it easy for you. I don't make it easy at all. Well, thanks a lot, Rich. Nice job. Very well done. Thanks, everybody, for uh, yeah. this, this hour. A lot of people ask where they can get your uh, session and where oh, your sorry. website is. Yes, just there. Sorry, I, I never got to that. Yeah, if you go to there, um, I'll be adding on to that throughout the rest of the afternoon. Um, but you'll have the slides and a link to most of the scripts we talked about on there. Um, if you've got any questions for me, um, you can grab me on the Slack community or email me, uh, rich at richbanner.com, if you need to. And Doug asks, can you address the dedicated admin connection? Okay, yes. Um, I, didn't, I specifically didn't mention that here because you have to set that up before things are burning. Um, but ultimately, what the dedicated admin connection is, is um, your you as a DBA, your back door into SQL Server, if, if everything's on fire and everything's melting, the dedicated admin connection is, is your connection as an admin to be able to, to get in and find out what's happening and try and, and fix it. With certain things, yeah, you won't be able to, to connect as a user. You won't be able to get in the front end because it's just such a mess. Um, having that dedicated ad admin connection is great. Um, but for this toolkit, if you don't set that up beforehand, you can't set that up in emergency. Uh, you need to have it set up in advance. Uh, so yeah, it's great. You, you definitely want it set up. Um, but because the assumption for this presentation was that you haven't seen a server before, um, and I always assume that everything's going to be set to default, that you might not have that opportunity. But yeah, you definitely want to set that up. If you, if you can get on a server, in advance and, and when you're setting up servers if you can set up the DAC, DAC connection excellent yeah definitely do that he says that makes sense thanks uh cv oral i have to look up cv orals oh uh elsimer says isn't the dac available by default but the remote dac requires setup mm -hmm. uh, yeah, possibly yeah i'd have to double check yeah you just can't uh usually when there's an emergency you can't remote desktop in 
Yeah. Vioral says on your bingo card, he'd like to add something. Last week, he had a guy uploading a picture to be inserted into the database by drag and drop via RDP. He had remote desktop. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a new one. I will I will update my uh, bingo card. So awesome. Absolutely. Great. And, and then JD keeps uh, being blown away by all these things that we're finding, like the, the, the things that the audit scripts detect and that are in your bingo card. He's like, oh, my God, I would use an oak stiff on the staff. Well, the things that you learn to transition or that you have to go from being a full-time DBA to working with other people's servers. Rich, how, I know you're doing a lot of this because you're taking over other people's servers do they, or working on other people's servers. Do they have a DBA? Do they not have a DBA? What's that look like? Depends on the client. Um, we are, we, we've got a variety. We've got, um, the, we make software for architecture firms. Um, quite often, you'll only have a three, four people um, office where they, they just don't have an IT person, let alone a DBA, up to companies that have um, 40, 50 people in their IT department. But they have more, um, they're more, concerned usually with your backups, your restores, your clustering, your availability, rather than performance issues. Um, there's quite a lot of, well, we're the product vendor, we sell them product, and usually the server that goes on it, or they use their own server they pre-provisioned. Um, but yeah, going on there, and sometimes, oh, well, as I mentioned a few times, I've given a few tools to our customer care team who can just quickly fix up and then Sometimes the client might have somebody to fix it themselves, or it comes to us. It, it, mm -hmm. No real preference, but yeah, it's such a wide variety of clients that that we have and that I deal with. It's it's interesting. It's stunning. It's varied. It's if for any of you out there who haven't worked for a software vendor before, just know that when you take that job, going to work for a software vendor, you're going to learn more about the crazy things that other people are willing to do with their servers. It is jaw dropping. Mm -hmm. Aaron drops in yeah. and nods. Aaron, what's the strangest thing you've ever seen on someone else's server? This should be good. Oh, he's, he's not allowed to say. Oh, he says he's muted. Well, hold on. We'll unmute you. Here we go. All right, now try now. No, he probably doesn't ah. even have a microphone. <laughs> there we go. It's an NDA. You won't know. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kind of prohibited from talking about most of the crazy <laughs> things that the customers do, but let me tell you, they know crazy. They know crazy. Well, thanks a lot, Rich. You have a lot of great positive messages over in Slack there. Check that out when you're done. Thanks for hanging out with us today, and uh, have a good week. Mm -hmm.